this the this morning this Berlin Diera smelled just like um, chocolate Tootsie Rolls, right? <laughs> it's a super cool plant from Texas um, that that actually maybe you can kind of smell the Tootsie Roll fragrance left in it. But like most plants, flowers are fragrant um, for a short period of time, right? And when we're designing gardens, I love to design gardens for all the senses and including taste. Like I, I really like to interact with my, with my own spaces. And so I love to design gardens that are fragrant in multiple ways. And since we're in the middle of the day and it's 106, uh, you know, air temperature, it feels like 106 degrees today, the plants are feeling the same thing. So normally fragrant flowers today aren't all that fragrant. But um, flowers, flowers and, and the, the vegetative parts of pl plants are fragrant for different reasons, completely different reasons, which I, I find really interesting too. So why are flowers fragrant? To attract, uh, yeah, to, say to attract bees. To attract pollinators, oh, yes, yeah. pollinators. But no flower is fragrant to attract bees. These bees use that, that their visual them. acuity to find flowers. And so flowers that attract bees have um, infrared and uh, ultraviolet um, uh, sort of arrows that point towards where the, the good pollen or the good nectar is on that flower. And they don't have to be fragrant at all. Um, they may have nectar that smells really sweet like honey that the bees are after, but they're not, they don't have to be fragrant to attract bees. And anything that's fragrant, um, and it's really wild, when you get to be good at plant ecology, at like, you know, it's like psychology for humans. You, you become a plant psychologist. You can look at a syndrome in a plant, and I can tell you about any plant out here, that white flower over there, Right, that hymenocallus. I know that those flesh, fresh flowers come out when it gets dark. They don't come out in the middle of the daytime. They come out when it gets dark. And I know that those flowers emit a fragrance because the type of flowers that are white and tubular always smell sweet. They always do. This big lily over here emits beautiful fragrance at night. White tubular flower. White tubular flowers that smell really, really sweet are pollinated by moths most of the time by sphinx moths, the fluttering kind there, the hovering kind of moth, okay? Um, plants that smell um, like fruit a lot of times can attract um, flies. So things like calicanthus, um, little sweet Betsy trillium. Um, a lot of plants, and we'll look at a few like this, smell like either poop or rotten meat. A huge number of flowers smell like that. Not just a couple, a huge number. And we love to collect those flowers here in our garden at, at Plant Delights, just so Tony can giggle at people when they walk down the trail holding their nose in the spring, right? A lot of these plants are ancient lineages. They're uh, members of the, of the aeroid family or they're members of what we call basal angiosperms that really came to be on the planet long before there were bees, butterflies, or moths. And so they're attracting the types of pollinators that, they, that were around to attract back then, the sort of Triassic-Jurassic boundary, right? So they're attracting flies and beetles instead of hymenopterids, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of just a sampling of what's out there um, for, uh, for plant sense with flowers. But most of what we're going to talk about today is not related to the flowers at all. And, and, and you can hold this, and I picked one really smelly so you can hold it at a distance due to COVID, right? You don't have to get <laughs> close to it. Squish it a little bit and you'll have no problem smelling this plant. And it should smell really, really familiar. What does that smell like to you? Oregano, but it's like way more potent than oregano. Um, what that plant it has in it that you're smelling is a chemical called thymol, which is uh, thymol. Some of these names for chemicals are pretty much like you take thyme oil, and if you're gonna make a chemical name out of it, it's an oil, so it's an all, so it's thymol, right? <laughs> And so it is, it's thyme oil that you're smelling in there. It's what gives oregano its flavor. It's what gives thyme its flavor. It's what makes mountain mint uh, so pungent. It's what makes uh, Monarda punctata, which is called dotted horse mint. Uh, some of you guys might grow that. It's kind of aggressive, but it's a wonderful plant for pollinators. Um, but it's what makes them uh, smell that way. And it's why we use them in cooking, right? Because we want our food to be flavored like that. Now, how many people in here know that that's um, a deadly poison? <laughs> thymol is very toxic and some plants have so much thymol in it that if you use a lot of it you'll get sick 
Uh, any of you guys do essential oils? Right, so th uh, or, or oregano oil is just really concentrated thymol in there, and if you use too much of that, it can end you up in the hospital. Okay, so that, that can be a deadly poison because it is poisonous in large quantities. And that's why this plant has it. Almost everything in the mint family have these wonderful oils, um, aromatic oils in them, that um, are there for defense, right? And we can use those in small amounts to flavor food, but you wouldn't want to like chop up a bunch of this, make a salad out of it, and eat this polyamintha. It would really give you a bellyache if you did that, because thymol is not that good for you in large doses. As a matter of fact, you, you can't even drink that pure oregano oil. It burns your mouth really bad um, because it is so strong. So. Um, Mint family plants, when we start thinking about mint is just like the quintessential. If you want to encourage pollinators, mint family plants are some of the best plants for pollinators out there. Um, their flowers don't have the toxin to keep uh, insects away, but the plants themselves are often sticky. They're glandular. They have oils in them that we use in cul for culinary uses, but those culinary uses for us are deterrents against things like aphids and myrids and sucking insects and chewing insects and beetles, because when they bite into it, they don't like it very much. It's like nicotine, right? Nicotiana, all the members of Nicotiana have nicotine in their stems, members of the tobacco family. And um, the nicotine is there, not so somebody can smoke a Winston like Fred Flintstone used to do. Anybody old enough to remember when they had, they had cigarette commercials on the cartoon. They did, it was crazy. They did. Fred would be like, hey, hey, Barney, you want a Winston, the smooth flavor of Winston. So I always think about that when I think about somebody smoking a cigarette. Um, but um, yeah, it's not there for that. It's the nicotine is a natural insect, insect repellent insecticide. And so we actually develop, uh, have developed in the horticultural industry a number of nicotine compounds that we use to treat um, plants as a systemic insecticide um, to, to prevent insect damage on plants over a long period of time. Now, it also can harm pollinators uh, in the case of some neonicotinoids, but it's also the thing that keeps uh, the few hemlock trees that are still alive in the mountains or alive because we've injected them with neonicotinoids that keeps the um, the, the little insect that the adelgid that eats the hemlock from eating the hemlock. Okay, so um, when we think about culinary herbs, basil, thyme, rosemary, lavender, um, oregano, mint, peppermint, spearmint, pennyroyal, they're all in the same family. They're all mints, right? So it's very important. Part part it Sage is a mint. Uh -huh. okay. Salvia is a mint. Yeah, absolutely. So mints. Great example of that. So we're going to look at a number. Here's one though. It, this is like the scratch and sniff class. So I've got one here that I, I really think is interesting. It's called uh, Lepicina hostata. And you'll never guess what family it's in. What's the, only, what's the only family we've talked about, right? Mint. So it's from Baja in Mexico. Um, one of the few plants that we can actually get away with growing um, from that part of Mexico. But this one I want you to, to uh, yeah, kind of brush the leaf a little bit before you smell it so that you get some of the oil moving. So you get the full effect. And then I know you're familiar with that scent. Doesn't it smell familiar? Lysol bathroom cleaner. <laughs> Does it not? Yeah. It smells like bathroom cleaner, Lysol. Yes, it does. It does. Again, so not all mints have really pleasant odors. Some of them have fetid odors. Some of them have odors that are strictly there for, um, for getting rid of, um, yeah, you can, you can, well, we can compost it. That's, that's fine. It's composted. I think my Lysol is not that strong. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? So, um, so when you're developing a garden, you know, you, you, sometimes you like to include plants that, that have flavor, you know, uh, have the odors that are, are pleasant to you. Sometimes you like to have something you can say, can you believe this shit? This smells like Lysol vacuum cleaner, right? Yeah, it's just cool to be able to do that sometimes. Let's, let's take a walk around a little bit and we'll, um, we'll look at some other things. I'm gonna take us mostly through the shade um, today and we're gonna end up in the, in the heat over there. Pine salt, Lysol, could be pine salt too. It's got, I mean, there's so many odors in that thing, it, but it definitely smells like a disinfectant, doesn't it? Yeah, really, very interesting. 
so it's so much better in the shade. So we really love this genus of plants, um, which has no odor to it right now. Um, but in the spring, um, these send up these giant, weird flowers that look like a brown peace lily, kind of, or a jack-in-the-pulpit, if you're familiar with it. This is the genus Amorphophallus. Um, and if you know Latin, that's kind of a dirty name. But um, anyway, it's known most of the time as a, uh, the common name for this group of plants is called corpse plant. And not all of them have flowers that smell like corpses, but most of them do. Um, some of them don't smell like dead people. Some of them smell like, um, oh gosh, Jeremy, how would you describe the odor of some of these things? You probably have to edit it out later. Yeah, <laughs> they're bad. <laughs> they're all bad. And it's a great example of one of those plants that um, here, instead of the odor being in the leaves, the odor is in this ridiculous, huge flower or inflorescence, really, is what it is. Um, and it's really taking advantage of animals. So if you think about um, how in your garden, deer and rabbit oftentimes take advantage of your plants, well, plant one of these because it tricks flies so bad that thousands of them will go in there and they'll lay their eggs in the flower thinking that they're laying their eggs on some dead guy. And when the maggots hatch, they die. They starve to death. So it's, it's tricking. It's taking advantage of the pollinator. And that type of pollination is called um, pollinator parasitism. Uh, so this is a pollinator parasite, a plant that is parasitizing its pollinator by taking advantage of it, forcing it to expend some of its energy as, and lose something of its own to gain uh, fertilization of its seed. So power to the plants, right? Amazing. Oh, it's crazy, all these things. I don't know if this has any scent on it yet, but um, hadikiums are among the, the most beautiful scent scented flowers you can put into your garden. Um, some of them, the orange flowered ones generally don't have a lot of scent, but any of the white flowered ones, they do. Um, and these are our ginger uh, lilies is what we call them. And, but they're white, right? And they're tubular. So when do you think they produce their scent? Night. At nighttime, yeah. And they're pollinated by? Moths. Moths, yeah, exactly. But they do have also in their leaves, um, you can smell a little bit of the gingery scent um, that tell you that it's in the ginger family. As things in the ginger family have a number of different oils in, in them that um, are specifically there for what? Why would they have these oils like ginger? You guys all are familiar with the flavor of ginger root. Why does ginger root have that, those um, really distinctive chemicals in it? Which I can never remember the name of, but I took a screenshot so I could tell you. <laughs> it's pyrogalol, p-hydroxy, benzoic acid, p-cumeric acid, and ferulic acid that they have in them that make them great, um, uh, great things for um, being medicinal plants. They're anti-cancer, they promote um, lots of healthy functioning in the body, and they're also antiseptic and anti-bacterial um, uh, that, that properties that, that those gingers have. But why do they have those chemicals? So we can be healthy, and every time we get a uh, little sniffle, drink ginger tea. Just to no. ward off parasites? Yeah. To ward off insects, yeah. It's another great chemical that for us, it has a use, but um, if you were a little tiny insect and you were taking huge numbers of that, you'd be like, ugh, I don't want to eat that plant, right? Do hummingbirds? Absolutely, hummingbirds love hadikium flowers um, because they're full of nectar. So even though they're, they're naturally pollinated by moths, and you know why they're naturally pollinated by moths? These plants are from Asia. And how many hummingbirds are there in Asia? Zero. All hummingbirds are New World, yep. North and South America only. So any plant in the Old World that's pollinated by birds um, it may have a red flower, but it also has a landing platform where the bird could actually land on the plant and uh, get into the nectar because they, no other bird on the planet can hover except the hummingbird, right? So kind of cool. Lilies all smell really nice and spicy, right? And a lily is a really good uh, example of a plant that is lots of nectar, smells really good, smells really spicy, and it tries to attract butterflies. So um, not a night flowering thing. Has lots of scent during the day. And in the case of most of our lilies that are native, they're pollinated primarily by swallowtails. Um, the swallowtail butterflies got big enough wings to hit these um, anthers out here and transfer that onto the stigma. But with um, these little skipper butterflies, the silver spotted skipper that's 
just popping around right there. I know they're like, they're the one butterfly that says, I'm so ugly, nobody wants to catch me, so I don't care, I'll just hang out here. Um, but they're, they're too small to effectively pollinate that plant. They just simply land on the flower and steal the nectar, right? So interesting stuff. All right, there is a Zingiber Miyoga around here somewhere. Where is that Miyoga? Jeez whiz. There you go. Zingiber Miyoga. <laughs> so this is a very interesting uh, plant to me. Um, and if I got any really brave folk in the audience here, well, um, you're welcome to try this. I'll show you, I'll prove to you that it's not trying to poison you. Um, but this is the flower spike the inflorescence developing of a Zingiber Mioga. So Zingiber is the genus of ginger, okay? And so Zingiber should smell like ginger. And when you crush it and smell it, this is a true Zingiber, just like Zingiber officinale. It does smell um, just like ginger. But in Japan, what they will do is slice these flower buds and they eat them fresh. So you slice it up and you make a salad sometimes mixed with cucumber, a little sesame oil, and a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, uh, soy sauce. And it's really, it's quite interesting and wonderful. So if anybody's really brave, I'll pull off all the stinky brown spots on it. But you can try it. It's, it, it's got a very unusual flavor. If you want to pick a piece and try it, you're welcome to. But that gingery odor that it has is in the leaves, it's in that, and it's there to protect it against herbivory, right? There to protect it against getting eaten. That's what I mean by sensory garden. I walk through the garden, I pick things, I eat it. It's not, not, bad. not bad. It has just a slight ginger, not really hot, very mild but very distinctive. Some people say it has a um, taste of cilantro. And after you chew on it a little while, you might get that cilantro-y taste to it as well. <laughs> well, let's go look at some really stinky ones. <laughs> we got all the good ones out of the way. The yeah, <laughs> all the good ones are gone, so. The Mioga has all the good compounds in it that make ginger and turmeric. Um, it has lots of curcumin in it, so it makes it has all those health benefits that you get from um, from ginger and, and curcuma. By the way, we I was when I was at Clemson, I was working with a, a couple of researchers on turmeric, which has amazing anti-cancer properties to it as well. So it's I can't say enough about the ginger family. Plant lots of those. Eat your garden plants. Here's an interesting one. This one has an odor that is um, unique. <laughs> it's not bad at all, um, but it's unique. And unless you've smelled uh, fresh ginseng before, you wouldn't know that it smelled like ginseng, but it smells exactly like ginseng. It's in the same group uh, within the carrot family. Ginseng's in the carrot family. Um, used to be considered the Aureliaceae, now they're lumping them all into the carrot family. But um, yeah, it's very nice. So this is a plant called spikenard, and this is a very commonly cultivated one from Japan that's called Sun King. We have a native one, spikenard here, Aurelia racemosa, has the same chemical in it. And that chemical is the same chemical that's in ginseng. Um, it's the same active ingredients that um, in traditional medicines, I think, give ginseng the power to make you smart and make blood flow to various regions of the body. Um, and it doesn't work. But this works just as well as ginseng. So why we continue to um, go out in the woods and dig up ginseng roots instead of, you know, use some other ginseng family things that are really easy to grow and like have the same extract. They all do the same thing, which is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting odor, isn't it? You can start to, to figure out families of plants just by the types of odors that they have. Um, everything in the citrus family smells like citrus. You know, everything in the, um, 
and the ginger family has a little bit of gingery odor to it. Um, This is what I call penance for making you smell all those really nasty things. <laughs> so here, smell some lavender. What family do you think lavender's in? Mm. Mint. Mint family, Lovely. right? Anything that we think, oh, that's such a pleasant odor. Probably in the mint family. So there's a, um, there's a term I'm going to teach you guys about um, plant odor today, a, a term for a particular type of odor. It's called fetid, okay? Oh, here's one. Here's one. Oops, you okay? Something flying. So here's one that's easy to, um, to identify the family on. Oh, onion, <laughs> right? Even though it might not, you might not even know what an onion flower looks like. Onions have umbels of flowers, just like milkweeds and carrots do. But they're umbel, they're a monocot with a globe-like, usually, umbel of flowers. And all of these plants in the onion family have varying levels of sulfur compounds in them that give them that smell like an onion. And what do you think those compounds are in there for? Keep things from eating it, right? Right. So, for umbel, yeah. So an umbel is of the uh, pedicels to each flower coming from exactly the same point. So, like an umbrella has all the spokes coming back to the common point, an umbel has all the all of the flowers coming back to the same point on the plant. So that's why we eat those, the sulfur compounds, right? So it's really the same things that are giving us the fragrance. Fragrance is such a part of our culinary experience that oftentimes the taste and the fragrance are the same, the same chemicals. Is, what, is it that the sulfur compounds are forwarded or muted by the soil? Like I'm thinking Vidalia onions. Oh like no, it just has less of the sulfur compound and more sugars okay. in it. So the sugars overwhelm those sulfur compounds. Yeah. The, the terroir of yeah. Vidalia is... Now, I mean, I, I'm from a J uh, Jewish family, so we don't like Vidalia onions. We like the really stinky hot okay. ones, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, some, not everybody likes Vidalia onions. <laughs> we always cook with Spanish onions, those yellow kind of tight ones that have lots and lots of sulfur in them. This one's interesting, okay, and this is one of those plants where, uh, did, remember I just gave you lavender, and remember the lavender. <laughs> this is Cucurbita fetida. Fetid, remember the term I told you I was going to get you to remember. Fetid just simply means bad. It means either like rotten meat or body odor like this. Um, yeah, so once you've, it, when you smell the, the plant up close, you may think, oh, it doesn't really smell like body odor, but then smell the fingers that touch that. Oh my God, everybody's going to think you didn't take a shower today. <laughs> Papa John's, it kind of does, it kind of does smell like Papa John's pizza crust. Yeah, 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 maybe it smells a little like Papa John's. Um, oh shoot, I was going to pick an iris fetid, it also has a really fetid odor to it, but let's, let's go to something a little more sweet. <laughs> oh, there's a good, this one's a good, this one's an interesting one. Let's, let's look at this one. almost forgot. So these flowers on this plant, this is Cestrum parkii, okay? It's from Chile, um, and it's uh, called like Chilean jazz, bush jasmine, or what is it? Cestrum is what we call it. Um, but uh, the flowers smell incredibly sweet at night. This is another moth pollinated species. So at night they smell incredibly sweet, but they have no odor during the day. But what I want you to smell is the leaf. And think Jif or Peter Pan. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh my goodness, really? Well, so just like peanut butter, doesn't it? Isn't that crazy? Wow. Yeah. So this plant is in the same family <laughs> as tobacco. I have a There's a jelly. But um, those chemicals that make it smell like peanut butter, guess why they're there? Protect the plant from herbivory. Again, something that's, that may smell good or, to some people unless you don't like peanut butter. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
And this is one of the more unusual, I think, good smells, but some people like it, some people don't. So sage um, is now in the genus Salvia. So many things are in the genus Salvia now. Salvia um, are all mints, and this one has so much oil in it. It grows, it's native to the deserts of central Mexico, and it has so much oil in it that you won't have any problem feeling it. This is Salvia darcii. Um, and you can smell, it's a very unusual smell, but salvias all have unusual minty smells that are complex. That's why sage, um, we cook with it with things like uh, meats, like lamb and, and those types of meats is to give them the complex flavor to complement their already complex greasiness of lamb. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, you don't use it on everything, right? And those are some of the complex odors that you can get from salvias in your garden. Every single salvia that we have, every single salvia we grow has a different odor. This one, I think, is the coolest to me. Okay, it's, that one can raise your really, blood pressure. That salvia darcii? Or sage in general. Oh, sage yes. in general, the, kid. Uh, yeah, and chemical order. so you just, what you do is you put some of the mioga in there because that actually <laughs> lowers blood pressure. <laughs> it also is an insulin, um, it stimulates uh, insulin processing, so it's good for diabetics too. So um, yeah. you can just put mioga in with your sage and you've corrected everything, right? Um, it's all about balance in life. So anyway, I really just wanted to give you guys an idea that um, there's so much out there. When you're picking a plant, when you're choosing a plant, don't ever just say, ooh, I like the way that looks. You want to touch it, you want to smell it, you want to feel that plant and see, you know, how how deep an experience and how intimate an experience that really interacting with your plants and gardening can be. And those are just a couple examples in the 15 minutes I turned into 30. <laughs> Thank you. Thank any you. any oh, questions like from that. anybody? <laughs> All right. Do I have any questions? Where are we now? At the edge of the sun garden? Yeah. Uh, so, no, you're, um, you're actually at the edge of the, um, the 41 of the other shade garden. Oh, yeah. Um, and the sun garden would be down the road and back across. Yeah, back across to this side. Okay. Thank All right. You. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. You guys have a great afternoon. Thanks for coming.